How does the world's most peaceful nation explain its obsession with nuclear bunkers? This is the Swiss concept. We have chocolate, the Alps, and we have uh, our bunkers. Digging beneath a British city, what brought these volunteers to a state of ecstasy? We found this arch from above. It was screams of joy. We're in! We found it! We found it! And how did Slovenia's young adventurers strike gold in a disused lead mine? This is the only underground kayaking route in the world. It's pretty special to come here. You never know what to expect. Beneath our feet lie extraordinary spaces, caves, and tunnels. The span and the size is just crazy. They've been designed and built by us. This is the only one with a castle. As well as formed by nature. But how were they created and adapted? By who and why? You've got to face your fears. Throughout history, subterranean life has captured our imagination. I feel so privileged. We're going further and deeper to unearth the mysteries, the stories, and the secrets of underground worlds. Switzerland, a peace-loving nation at the heart of Europe. All its neighbors, Germany, France, and Italy, have been dragged into military conflicts over the last century. While Switzerland always stayed neutral, never engaging in war. The country has also fiercely defended its independence. Its government has a master plan to protect every citizen in the event of a nuclear war, which involves going underground. Even if you are neutral to a war, you still need some protection. Swiss law decrees that every citizen must have a place in a fallout shelter. These buildings just demonstrate how massive the threat perception must have been. There are now 300,000 of these shelters in Switzerland. Ample room for the entire population. Underground, you're safe. But it's not an easy life. Photographer Didier Ruff has spent more than 30 years documenting Switzerland's underground worlds. In Switzerland, the bunkers are everywhere. In the private house, in the schools, in factories, in the hospitals, everywhere. Throughout the 20th century, Switzerland feared military aggression. During the Cold War, the threat was nuclear attack. In the child of the 60s, the threat was atom attack. And in that case, it was needed to have the shelter this uh, protected underworld bunker, and this is where it's all started. However, the Swiss were digging underground way before the nuclear threat. In 1939, just before World War II, Switzerland strengthened its border defenses along the River Rhine. The threat of German invasion here was all too real. So the Swiss built the mighty Festung Fortress. This vast fortified bunker was the first line of defense and is sunk 20 meters into the hillside. As part of his research, Didier has come to the fortress to meet historian Walter Loy. We are right there on the border, about 500 meters further down. You will come to the river line and the other side is Germany. Germany. Yes. Walter has been caretaker for the last 20 years and is an expert on its military history. Well, it was originally planned and built for, for 90 men. Then we had decreased up to 160. Now we are entering the main gully. We are here about 15 meters underground and it's getting deeper and deeper. The main tunnel is 210 meters long and provides access to the four observation towers, two of them armed with 75 millimeter long range rapid firing guns. Uh, so it closes yes. automatically. He so the empty shell out, the next one goes in, and so on. These semi-automatic guns had a range of 11 kilometers and were capable of firing up to 20 shots a minute. Soldiers would train them on their targets using numeric charts that were advanced for the era. 
You look through there and you see points. Each one has a number. And he turns the wheel till he has it. Uh, and then he's ready. That's, for the time, one of the most modern guns which exist. Festung was ready by 1939 and used to monitor the German border throughout the Second World War. The Swiss Army only decommissioned the fortress in 1988. At the height of the war, up to 100 soldiers would be stationed underground here for up to one month in a state of constant alert. Their living quarters included basic wooden bunk beds, a large kitchen, and a hospital with a surgery. Underground, you're safe. But it is depressing if you stay for days and days and you never come out of it. You, you are losing the sense for, for day and night. It's not an easy life. That's been terrible. To be, to be here locked inside like mouses with no sun, no, no, terrible. At the center of the fortress are the vital amenities needed to keep the men alive during each month-long vigil. There are two diesel generators, one acting as a backup, along with water tanks and air purifiers. I had two sets of filters, one running, one standby. And then the air goes, goes into this distribution, and throughout the floor it's, it's distributed. The air supply had to be heated to 30 degrees to stop the gunner's glasses and gas masks from steaming up. Water, we had 60,000 uh, liters. That would have lasted for about uh, six weeks. Food, well, we had uh, about three weeks. But air, that, that's crucial, that's crucial. The deepest tunnel ran 20 meters into the mountain and offered soldiers an escape route if needed. So, and that leads us to a bunker. It's also used as emergency exit. You want to go? Oh, nice. That is the engine. This deepest tunnel is 290 meters long. To me, this place is like a submarine. It's a, it's a place where you lose contact with reality, with time, and uh, you're totally uh, closed in a cellar. I'm, I'm a bit lost in this underground alley now. I don't know in, exactly where we are anymore. It's confusing. You can get easily, you can get lost. I see this place as a sign of the past. Swiss has always been fighting to protect this small territory and the bunker would be the way to protect the population. Thanks to military defenses like the Festung Fortress, Switzerland was not invaded during World War II. The Nazis resorted to a war of words, calling Switzerland a medieval remnant. But the Festung installation proves how modern and efficient the Swiss capabilities were. When the war was over, the threat of Nazi invasion was replaced by fear of nuclear attack during the Cold War arms race. Historian Dr. Michael Olsansky explains how the Swiss love affair with underground bunkers grew more passionate as a result. The Swiss authorities uh, finalized the plan that every Swiss citizen should have his own safe place in the case of war. Every community in Switzerland has to have this kind of protecting installations. At the height of the Cold War in the 1960s, plans to improve the motorway network around the city of Lucerne paved the way for an incredible engineering project, directly underneath a normal-looking road tunnel. They were planning to build two tunnels. A clever politician came up with the idea that they could design the tunnels in such a way so that they could take a secondary bunker function. Over 10 years, Zora Schelbert has got to know every inch of this place, the Sonnenberg Bunker. Zora's going to show Didier how a massive public bunker like Sonnenberg is organized. In here, 
you get a good idea of the whole height of the building, which is 20 meters. 20 meter high, yes. In the build-up to an attack, the tunnel doors would close. 700 staff would transform this underground facility into a supersized bunker for 20,000 people. It's the ultimate example of Switzerland's commitment to protecting its citizens. As with the World War II fortress, air supply is vital. But while Festung had two filtration units, the Sonnenberg bunker has 120. All of these filters here were designed to filter any then known nuclear, biological and chemical agent so that the 20,000 people in the two tunnels could have been provided with fresh air if everything had been contaminated outside. This reminds me a lot about the filtration system that, that we have in the private bunkers. So it's yeah, just the, it's the scale is just uh, massive. Yes, because it was designed uh, for a third of our city's inhabitants. Those 20,000 citizens would have been divided up into groups of around 750 people, occupying different zones underneath the motorway tunnel and inside the central seven-story facility that's hidden underground. 450 tons of flat-pack furniture still lies in wait for them. So this room you would have been sharing with another 63 people. Imagine 30, 40 people tossing, turning, snoring, coughing, crying. Unimaginable. The sanitation facilities are basic, with no showers, and would have been shared by hundreds of people. Water would have been taken from the communal water supply, from purified groundwater and the city river. And if these three options had failed because of contamination, they would have had water tanks in water place. Water tanks, OK. But it would have been rationed to four liters per person a day. They thought half of it for hydration and the other half for hygienic purposes. And after two weeks, well, two weeks is just as far as the plan was went. Went, yes. The logistics center is in the heart of the structure it contains everything needed to run this enormous underground bunker. This is the top level, which used to be the security station with prison cells mm. for potential tunnel troublemakers. Provision was made in the prison wing to keep only 16 people locked up out of 20,000 inhabitants. And the color, by the way, is still the original paint. You'll see a lot of yellow and green, a little bit of color psychology. Yes. Yellow for sunlight, green for nature. The command post was on the upper level. The civil defense team would run the facility from here. They had telecommunications facilities and a radio station to broadcast to other bunkers around the country. This would have been their sole means of communication with the outside world. Every now and then they would have played some music as well, probably something soothing to mm -hmm. not upset people. Obviously, also, they would have chosen any news very wisely. Of course. Things that would keep their hopes up. Mm, 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 mm. Hidden away in the facility is an underground hospital spread over three floors with two operating theatres. This room in here is the only room that is not painted in green or yellow, but in this salmony orange. Salmon. Do you have any idea why? Who, why this color? For whom? No idea. It was the nursery. Nursery. Apparently it's a soothing color. Nursery. Yeah, because even during two weeks there would have been Some babies uh, were born. women yeah, giving yeah. birth. As an architecture, it is amazing. We could almost say it's an underground city. You have a hospital. You have the bed, accommodation, police spec, also a maternity. People could be jailed, could give birth, and uh, life would go on, but only 14 days. From the logistics center, there is only one way of accessing the tunnels themselves. So the noise is... This is traffic in the west tube. Tunnel 
Yes. Yes. The A2 motorway that runs through the tunnels carries 55,000 vehicles a day. The concrete blast doors at both ends, they're oh, yes. 1.5 meter thick and 350 tons each, and apparently able to withstand the blast of a one megaton nuclear bomb as close as one kilometer away. When the Cold War came to an end in the early 1990s, the costs of maintaining an underground nuclear shelter were too high. The bunker's role as a shelter for 20,000 people was finally abandoned in 2006. But the ever-cautious Swiss have maintained the central areas with a capacity for 2,000 people, just in case. It's part of the zeitgeist of the era. These buildings just demonstrate how massive the threat perception must have been in the 60s. Is this nice idea, utopia, that we could protect the people by putting them in a shelter. It was unique and it was saying something deep about Switzerland and its culture and its history. The Swiss are not building mega bunkers anymore, but since the 1960s, their focus has been on providing mini bunkers for all citizens that are considered to be like any other room in your house. There are now more than 300,000 of them under residential development and public buildings like hospitals. Didier has come to Andelfingen, north of Zurich, to see one of these shared residential shelters. Growing up in Switzerland, in every uh, building, we have these uh, personal shelters. He's meeting an engineer who is tasked with building these private bunkers. Within the last 15 years, we built around 6,000 large bunkers, up to 500 people. We still also built uh, the smaller shelters, around 30,000, I would say. We built this public shelter in 2006. You will see a lot of other similar to this one. 36 people can go inside of this shelter. And they're supposed to stay how long inside? For at least 14 days with the necessary food and water. 14 days? Yeah. The room is just six by 10 meters and entry is via a concrete blast door weighing 900 kilograms. That's basically the shelter, how it looks like. A dry toilet, no water inside because this would be a weakness for the shelter itself. So it's not a lot of intimacy. Eh? Once you're inside, you are uh, mixed with uh, all your neighbors and family, friends, and, and you have to share this uh, tiny space. Yeah, that's true. There is also a second exit. It's just for the worst case, if you cannot reopen the, the blast door. And that's always built in every shelter. There is no other country where bunkers are so commonplace. Even if you are neutral to a war, you still need some protection. And it's still common to build these things. And it's, I would say, necessary because you never know what happens. What you need is a place to rest, a place to breathe, and a place to, to survive. It's a survival kit. This is the Swiss concept in the modern age. It's part of the tradition. We have chocolate, we have banks, we have uh, the Alps, and we have uh, our bunkers. For more than 80 years, Switzerland has either built or adapted subterranean spaces to protect the safety of its population. What's special about the Swiss underground world, be it military or for the protection of the civil population, it's the only country in the world that has a safe place concept like this. The threats may have changed over time, but the demand for protection remains. Now with access to more underground bunkers than ever before, the Swiss are ready 
for every eventuality. Liverpool, the historic and powerful trading port in the northwest of England. Iconic buildings line the waterfront of a city steeped in maritime history. In the east of the city, beneath the streets of Edge Hill, lies an underground world that's shrouded in mystery. Like the span and the size is just crazy. But how did it get here? Finally reached the bottom and found ourselves 60 feet below ground. And who built it? He was so secretive, burrowing away for 35 years. A group of determined volunteers are slowly revealing this extraordinary creation in a search for answers. Keeps us going to good hobby. Mad, aren't we? For 20 years, Volunteer coordinator Chris Isles has been fascinated with the labyrinth of tunnels built by 19th century businessman Joseph Williamson. Well, I've always been interested in underground spaces, man-made especially, and I've always been aware of the local legend of Joseph Williamson and his tunnels at Edge Hill. Joseph Williamson was a tobacco merchant and landowner during the Georgian era. He moved to Liverpool in 1805, People called him the King of Edge Hill or even the Mole of Edge Hill. And I remember being intrigued by it and wanting to know more. Joseph Williamson was uh, in the tobacco industry. He married the boss's daughter, made a lot of money. He basically inherited the company and became a very rich man. David Bridson of the Heritage Centre has researched the full extent of Joseph Williamson's wealth. So he was able to retire at the age of 49 with something like £400,000 in the bank. Now, we've seen various estimates of how much that would be worth today, but anything from 25 up to £50 million. Pounds. And he then spent the rest of his life paying men using that money to build these tunnels and build the houses on top. In 1805, Joseph Williamson bought up an area of land that was uninhabitable because it was an abandoned quarry. The land around here had been quarried out for sandstone as Liverpool grew and expanded. We'll never know what gave Williamson the idea, but he hit upon this seemingly crazy idea of roofing them over. In effect, Williamson reclaimed abandoned land. He had pillars and tunnels built into the quarry, lined them with bricks, and built streets and houses over the top. But no map was ever left to show what was now sealed underground. So we have these beautiful brick and sandstone vaults, all sorts of sizes from a few inches across up to this one at 25 feet, all purely to reclaim the quarry workings and create usable land in the Edge Hill area. Nothing remains of the properties Williamson built apart from the facade of his great house. After he died in 1840, the caverns grew derelict and were filled in with earth and building waste. We knew of the existence of, of the chambers on, uh, beneath the buildings that were above. In 1995, the tunnels were rediscovered by a group of amateurs, one of whom was Chris Isles. We, we dug down and we found this arch from above and smashed through there. There were screams of joy. We're in! We found it, we found it. It was the start of an amazing project, but the enthusiasts soon faced their biggest challenge. Williamson's long lost tunnels had been filled in with a mixture of rubble and junk dumped by the Victorians, which needed clearing out. Glass bottles, jars, you name it, it's down here. It had been used as a Victorian uh, tip. The enthusiasts had no idea how deep the tunnels were, and with no surviving map, no idea of how far they ran, it took them 10 long years to win permission from local authorities to excavate them. But Chris's colleague Tom Stapledon remembers clearly the day they started to dig. We had the first skip delivered on site on the 18th of November, I think it was, 2012. 
and uh, we spent four solid years emptying this place out until we finally reached the bottom and found ourselves 60 feet below ground. There was a spoil piled right up to the roof, virtually, uh, to the end of that chamber. Um, you couldn't have climbed over the top of it, and we had no idea what was beyond. In among the spoils, the volunteers were excited to discover treasures from the Victorian and Edwardian eras. One of the things I always pick on is that little mug there. It's definitely a coronation mug because it says 1902 on it. That we know would be the coronation of Edward VII. And one day somebody chose to clean it out for some reason and found there was something in the bottom. We didn't know what it was. And for no apparent reason, somebody thought to hold it up to the light. And that's what appeared. That is King Edward VII, and he's embossed into the china clay before the pottery's been fired. Since found out that it's called lithophane work, it's a rather nice little thing, and it always terrifies me every time I pick it up, in case I'm the one who drops it. Though the excavation is still underway, so far the team has discovered around three kilometers of tunnels with three access points. But there is still so much to discover about why some of the brickwork is even here. This is the Arch to Nowhere. Uh, we call it the Arch to Nowhere because essentially as you come in you think, oh, it's a tunnel entrance going off to the left. But in reality it's not. I wonder whether it might have been a practice piece for apprentices. Or maybe there was going to be another tunnel going off into the quarry wall. But for whatever reason, it never happened. Joseph Williamson was highly secretive about the tunnels. And why were these underground spaces created with so much meticulous brickwork? There, there is a, a lot of mystery to Williamson because Williamson, as far as we know, never left any paperwork to say why exactly he did what he did. He was so secretive. Yeah. He didn't boast about what he was doing. He didn't talk to many people about what he was up to. It was just him and the men who worked for him burrowing away for 35 years. In the early 19th century, the UK was rife with unemployment. Some people in Liverpool believed that Williamson acted out of a spirit of philanthropy, offering work to men in need of a job. Through Williamson and his tunnels, they were able to gain meaningful employment. They were able to take a wage home. They kept their pride. They were able to feed and clothe their families. As the excavation continued deeper, the brick vaulting gave way to the raw rock face of the original quarry, which showed the sandstone was laboriously cut by hand. You can see in certain places where the men have been hacking out with the hammer and chisel. And you can see it goes, it goes in different directions. That could be somebody who was left or right-handed doing the, the, the different angle. It took the volunteers four years to clear out the northern section of the tunnels beneath an area known as Paddington. In 2016, they reached the bottom. I'm standing at about 60 feet below ground level here. By the time we finished, it felt like a brilliant achievement to have emptied this place out. At the same time, for all of us, there was a serious disappointment that we didn't find any tunnels leading off this. Uh, which we hoped would have connected up with the rest of the Williamson Tunnel system. But their disappointment was short-lived. Just around the corner stand the remains of the house where Williamson lived with his wife, Elizabeth. The volunteers have made some tantalizing discoveries beneath it. This is Williamson's house, or what's left of Williamson's house. It's the last remaining above-ground structure that was built by Williamson that we know of. We've been uncovering what's below ground because there's nothing left above ground to be seen. Well, I think the thing that, that uh, I found interesting was the finding the four fireplaces with their, complete with their ranges. And of course, finding stone carved skirting board as well, which shows that you are inside his house. Beneath the cellar, they discovered a great void. No one knows what it was used for, but the volunteers have given it a nickname. This is the banqueting hall. Williamson's had his men quarry out all the stone from this chamber. He's used the stone for building, and then he's vaulted over it with this lovely brick archway, 
and then he's built his own three-story house right on top of it. Each week, around 20 volunteers work here across the site. One of them is a recent arrival to Liverpool, an American, Caitlin McGann. It started because I was like, oh, it's just archaeology I can go do, but now it's just like, this is my favorite place. These people are like family, so it's just kind of like coming to hang out every Sunday and Wednesday with all my friends digging in tunnels. The first time I went down there, it was just dirt. There was just dirt everywhere. That's all it was. There was nothing else. And then each time I went down, it was just like, whoa. Like there's, the walls are starting to show up. And then we were like, we found the floor. And then we were like, there isn't a floor because now we have this new tunnel coming out. And so every time it's just like, this, like the span and the size is just crazy. The newest area of the tunnels to be discovered was found behind a brick wall. Volunteers on their hands and knees with buckets and shovels are here today to remove more soil. We've just come along to try and uncover the mystery of why he did, why he did them, why he dug them and where they go to. So it keeps us digging. Every weekend or every week I'm here, it's always something new to find. Because uh, he's left no plans, there's no designs. This is the only part of his house that's still standing. And um, we're here most weeks and keeps us going to good hobby. Mad, aren't we? Well, I think we're in the start of a much bigger tunnel. But at the moment, we're right up in the roof of it. If this is the big tunnel, there may be another 35 foot to go down here. Without the hard work of the volunteers, these tunnels and their intricate arches may have never been discovered. It's incredibly rewarding working on this. Um, the, the, the tunnels are so unique. We just want to see as many of these tunnels as possible made accessible for the people of Liverpool and everybody from all over the world to come and view them. It's incredibly important to uh, carry this on. Unearthing these phenomenal tunnels, the volunteers have opened the door to another world. Each week I come, we don't know what we're gonna find. We could find a new tunnel. We could find a new like bricked in area of a room with tons of finds in it. You just never know. So that's what's so exciting. There's a lot going on, a lot more to find. We sometimes joke that uh, somewhere buried, there is a big trunk full of all of Williamson's papers but at the same time, it's the fact that we have so little information that's so intriguing. And I think for most of us, it's what drives us on to keep looking for answers. The enthusiasts working hard underground to discover the truth and the citizens of Liverpool above them may never really understand the enigma of Joseph Williamson and his tunnels. Slovenia a central European country known for its soaring peaks, descending into thousands of natural caves. Beneath its beautiful landscape, on its northern border with Austria, a network of tunnels created by man unveils a rich history. They uh, fill it with explosive and they just blasted it. But out of the darkness... You know, when one thing died, the second thing is born. ...comes a new world of exploration and adventure. We are really, really deep, 750 metres down in the mine. ...to navigate one of the largest man-made underground worlds by torchlight. It's the only underground kayaking route in the world. Why would mountain bikers want to venture into the mine? It's not for beginners, super technical, super steep. And how was their access made possible? The cave rescue team of Slovenia, they came and help us so with some explosives. The tranquility of the Caravank mountain range is broken by the constant whir of spinning wheels. Mountain biking has become a high-octane sport in Slovenia, and it's also gone underground. Inside the Petsa mountain lies a vast mining network once used to extract precious metals. Now it's a breathtaking racetrack for adrenaline junkies like Anne. It's not for beginners. This is for advanced and expert mountain bikers. This is not a place to try out your skills. Super technical, super steep sections going down with some small drops. Anne's family has direct links to the history of the Mazicha mine. His grandparents toiled in these tunnels before it was closed. Yeah. 
Now Anne has created the only extreme subterranean bike route in the world, the Black Hole Trail. It was all handmade, no machinery. We asked for help the cave rescue team of Slovenia and they came and helped us also with some explosives on some areas to actually build the whole trail. Opened in 2017, the Black Hole Trail was built in the abandoned tunnels of the Masiccia lead and zinc mine. The track runs for a staggering 10 kilometers. When we started work, we actually knew nothing about working in the mine. So uh, we always had the supervision and help of ex-miners, because without them we couldn't do anything like this. The 800-kilometer mine network was abandoned in the 1990s. But Anne dreamed of creating the most challenging bike trail ever to be made underground. Uh, this is uh, all limestone. If there would be an earthquake here, we would be safer here in the mine than outside in the buildings. The trail attracts thousands of intrepid riders from all corners of the globe. On the trail you have different terrains, like you have sandy terrain, which is like quite slippery, uh, like surfing on a mountain bike. Then you have a pure rock, which has a really a lot of grip. All the time uh, when you're riding, you need to focus. Expect the unexpected uh, at all times. These chambers lay untouched for 25 years, but there are still many tunnels that are too dangerous to ride. You have chamber by chamber, tunnel by tunnel. I think after that reach, you have quite a free fall. and it keeps on falling. If you don't know where to go, it's pretty easy to get lost. The trail drops underground from one valley to another through five levels to a depth of 150 meters. In Slovenia, this trail is the uh, only trail, uh, going from one point to another point without going on it twice. More times I do it, more fun I have. All the other caves in the world were made by nature, but this cave was made by the humans. When the bikers leave and the sounds of racing tires subside, the last vestiges of the mining equipment sit in silence and darkness. The mine dates back to the 1600s and was a rich source of lead and zinc. More than 800 kilometers of tunnels were excavated for its precious metals. For decades, geologists like Juros Helets have continued to explore the mine's network to better understand the makeup of the bedrock they've discovered just how stable the tunnels and shafts are. The first time I visited this place was uh, 35 years ago. And uh, actually it was a field trip. The area is built out of uh, very stable rocks. And that means that you can visit sometimes uh, tunnels which were built 300, 350 years ago. In over three centuries of mining, 19 million tons of lead and zinc ore were excavated from the tunnels. Digging was discontinued at the end of the 19th century. The uh, most important mineral in this area is this uh, dark uh, mineral with metallic luster, which is uh, lead sulfide. Um, this is zinc sulfide. It's a little bit brownish, sometimes greenish, yellowish. Lead and zinc and their derivatives appear in many everyday objects. Lead can be found in roofing materials, car batteries and ammunition, while zinc is often used in alloys, paints, cosmetics and plastics. Massive effort was required to extract these minerals from the rock walls. They had to drill uh, a hole uh, for, let's say, uh, to half a meter, one meter deep. They uh, fill it with explosive and they just blasted it. By the early 1960s, the Mazicha mine employed more than 2,000 people. Whilst he was still at school, Miram Prost worked here two days a week. So here, here you see the uh, different roads, the different tunnels uh, in the different ways. And this is because we built these tunnels for uh, researching. So we searched for lead with the tunnels. It was a very interesting job. 
And each time when I came to the work, it was not the same place, not the similar place. Each time was something different, you know. A temporary drop in world prices for metal and rising mining costs brought production to an end in 1994. On the last day uh, when we work in the mine, uh, the workers were sad because uh, we shut the pumps down, the mine started getting flooded with water and that kind of stuff. And uh, of course it was sad, but uh, you know, when one thing is go uh, died, the second thing is born. Miran is proud of the mine and its achievements. He takes great pleasure in showing visitors around the extensive tunnel system. It's interesting for the people who visit us because they don't expect to see something like, like the mine. In Egypt, they built the pyramid, <laughs> but uh, we built the mine over here. Following the closure of the mine, the local community began developing another industry, geotourism. At the 1997, we opened the first part of the touristic mine and museum. Now, around 40 kilometers of the mine can be visited by tourists. Exploring by miner's train or on foot, they can see the great caverns excavated by hand. This mine is all time alive. Relics from the mine's industrial past evoke memories of a bygone era. After the Mazicha mine was closed, water was no longer pumped out, allowing the lower chambers to flood, creating magical underground lakes. This is the only underground kayaking route in the world. For those who want to delve deeper, Lara Pico takes people on unique kayaking routes. It's pretty special to come here every day and just to see it because it's something really unique and not a lot of people get to experience that. Every time it's different, every day it's different. The water level is not the same every day, so you never know what to expect. In these caverns where men once toiled, now a network of rivers flow, carrying six million cubic meters of fresh mountain water. The water is really clean and I'm gonna prove it to you by drinking it. but cold. We are around 750 meters below the surface, so we are really, really deep down in the mine. You can see the railroad, because there used to be a train going through the tunnels. There are three and a half kilometers of underground waterways for visitors to navigate. You can go explore it on your own. You can go through the low tunnels, through the big empty spaces, the galleries. And we also have a small rapid in here. And for the braver ones, you can also jump in. I never fall off. The water is too cold. So I am always very careful. Since 2013, over a quarter of a million tourists have visited the mine and more than 20,000 have descended on their bicycles. So it's really interesting because along the way you can find a lot of different stuff. You can find minerals, you can find of course the ore, you can also find old signatures of the miners that used to work here. So the whole history of the mine, you can actually see it in here. Conditions that are in here are extreme, the cold, the water. I really admire the miners, what they did. Rich in history and precious metals, the Masicha mine has now become a paradise for extreme sports fans. This really is an exhilarating underground world.